Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We are so glad you are here. If you are new to Dungeness Community Church, we'd love to connect with you. It's as easy as uh, texting hello to 360-683-7333. The Loss of a Spouse Seminar is a friendly, caring group of people who will walk alongside you through one of life's most difficult experiences. You can go to dcchurch.org and click on the banner to register. Or you can call the church office at 360-683-7333. You really do not have to go through this journey alone. We hope you can join us. Women's Bible Study will be starting on Tuesday, September 8th and Thursday, September 10th. Go to dcchurch.org and click on the banner and you can register. The Tuesday class will be in the evening and Thursday will be in the morning and it will all be on Zoom. Youth movie nights are coming up again this week. Tonight, actually, the high school will meet at six o'clock in the auditorium and tomorrow night, middle school will meet also in the auditorium at six o'clock. If you have any questions, contact Darren Sweeney at 360-477-7255. We are planning to have in-person youth groups in the fall. High school will be on Sundays, beginning September 14th at 6.30 p.m. in the auditorium. Middle school will be on Mondays, beginning September 15th, also at 6.30 in the auditorium. There will also be a young adults group beginning on Tuesdays, and that will be starting on the 16th of September at 7 p.m. The plan will depend on any new restrictions, so if you have any questions, Contact Darren Sweeney at 360-477-7255. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, just want to remind you, next Sunday is our summer celebration out of the Cole Farm on West Swim Bay Road. So I hope you're making plans for to come. We want everyone to be there. We've got lots of parking. It's a drive-in service. Uh, I'd encourage you to come at least by 9.30. The service starts at 10, but that'll make sure that we have time to get everyone parked. Uh, if you haven't yet registered, please go online and do that right now. That is going to help us know how many cars we need to park next Sunday. Uh, we're going to be doing some celebrations of people, great music, doing communion together. We have a walk of remembrance. Uh, so I hope you're making plans for next Sunday for our drive-in service at the Cole Farm. The other thing I want to let you all know is that starting on September 13th, we are going to begin an in-person live Sunday morning service at DCC. It's going to be at 9 o'clock. Uh, seating is limited. We have room for about 90 people with the social distancing, and so you do need to make reservations ahead of time. The reservation forms are not ready yet. They'll be ready by September 1st, and you'll do that by going online to dcchurch.org. You'll look for the banner there, and you'll be able to register at that time. Uh, so we're going to start off with that service, 9 o'clock, Sunday, September 13th, and uh, we'll see how this goes. And of course, in these days, as with everything, all of those plans are contingent on everything staying the way it is right now in terms of our phases of reopening. Uh, if that changes, we'll keep you updated. So, look forward to seeing you next Sunday at the Summer Celebration. This week's Kids Chat is up next, so take it away, Pastor Britt. Good morning, DCC Kids. Did you have a chance to check out James 5, verses 1 to 6 this past week? If so, what was your big idea from this section of his letter? Here's my big idea. Riches are risky. You probably noticed James had some pretty strong warnings for wealthy people. The fact is, though, money by itself is not good or bad. It's how we use money that matters. For sure, money can easily be misused or spent on things that have nothing to do with what God says is important. You may have heard of the idea of a steward. In the days when Jesus lived, a steward was given the task of managing a rich person's money. The steward didn't actually own the money, but used it to do what the owner of the money wanted. Today, as followers of Jesus, we're stewards on behalf of God, with our time, our gifts and talents, and, for sure, our money. There's a great verse I talked about in my message to DCC a couple weeks ago. 
It's from Paul's first letter to his young friend, Timothy, who was leading a local church. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That's 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. Being rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share are important ways we put feet to our faith. This coming week, we're going after what I call the DCC Kids Be Rich Project. If you're a DCC kid in kindergarten through fifth grade, I'm going to give you $5 to invest in God's work in the world. You might immediately have an idea of what you can do to help God's work in the world through a gift of $5. If you don't, maybe start with this question. What matters to you these days and what God is up to in our world? You can get help with ideas from your mom or dad or a grandparent. There are so many ways God can use your Be Rich gift. It's super important to remember that this money doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. You're simply serving as a steward. By the way, it's totally fine if you want to combine your gift with two or three other DCC kids to make it into a larger gift for one cause you all want to help. It's all about being rich in good deeds and generous through being a good steward of the money. But I hope you have fun too. Most of all, I pray you experience the joy that comes when you honor God through being generous with money. Parents or grandparents, you'll need to stop by the church office this coming week and pick up $5 for each child, kindergarten to grade five in your family. Our office staff will be glad to help you. If you need a starting point for ideas to assist your kids, visit the DCC webpage and check out the local engagement and global engagement pages. There are also great options through organizations like Compassion International. As a follow-up, please send me an email of how your young steward invested his or her $5. You can email me at the church, brit at dcchurch.org. Kids, next week is our summer celebration drive-in service at the Cole Family Farm. I'll talk with you in two weeks about James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20, but I hope to see you at the summer celebration. Until then, take care and be well in Jesus. Bye. Good morning, church. We're so glad you're with us this morning. We're going to be singing some songs. We hope you join us. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is amazing grace.
and give him the glory. He is so worthy. you were
thing just about every small business owner has to confront sooner or later is deadbeats. Those clients that receive services or products on credit and then don't want to pay. When I was in business, doing collections was a drag, but I was never really hesitant to do it because getting paid was the only way I could feed my family, pay my employees, cover the expenses that went with running a business. Now, when it came to selling products in our business, that wasn't a big problem because we required payment up front. But service was another issue. You don't know how much time or materials may be involved until the job is done. So you're always billing after the fact. Now, most clients were great. They appreciated the service and they paid on time. I actually had a doctor give me a healthy tip once over and above the cost of service because I've been able to find a rare part for his x-ray unit and I helped him avoid some expensive downtime. Now those are the people that you want to work for. But then there were the others. You know, the deadbeats. 
Maddeningly, it was sometimes the biggest companies with the most money that were the most difficult. I remember one company who shall remain unnamed. We did a lot of service for them, but they were always late paying. Not just a little late, a lot late, like months late. And every month we would call their accounts payable department and every time they would tell us that they hadn't received the invoice. Uh, they'd ask us to send them another copy. And it became obvious after a while that this was just a stalling technique. So I had my office manager create a Dropbox folder. Uh, Dropbox is a way that you can store documents on the web where people can access them remotely. And we started putting all of their invoices into that folder. And then every email that we sent that client included a link to the folder so that they could find those invoices just as often as they needed. Well, not surprisingly, it didn't change anything. The problem never had been finding the invoices. Their problem was not wanting to pay. Finally, we told them that we were going to suspend service until all back payments and past due penalties were paid. And because of the nature of their business, suspending service was bound to cause them some real problems. And sure enough, payments started pouring in. Now, one thing they didn't send was the payment for past due penalties. We reminded them that those were still owing. And they informed us that they had a policy that they didn't pay past due penalties. Well, we informed them that we too had a policy. Our policy was we didn't resume services for companies that had outstanding past due penalties. I'm pleased to report that our policy won. Now, as we were working through this, we discovered that what they had done to us, they did to all of their vendors. Many of them were small businesses like ours that allowed the abuse to go on because they felt that company was so big they couldn't afford to lose the business. But eventually, we ended up terminating our relationship with that client. See, keeping the business of a company, no matter how big, that didn't pay their bills really wasn't losing anything other than a headache in my way of thinking. But the big and powerful, taking advantage of little guys for their own profit is nothing new. Our country has been rocked in recent months with racial tension, tension arising from the dark stain of slavery. But if you examine the great empires of every nation throughout history, you will find that it has been systems like slavery underpinning their accomplishments. The powerful using the powerless to enrich themselves. This very problem was addressed by none other than Moses way back in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 24. He said, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. You know, there are still plenty of structures in our world today that continue that history of rich defrauding poor. Whether it is a subcontractor getting cheated out of his wages, or a foreign worker in a distant sweatshop who is eking out a barely livable wage to manufacture high-tech gadgets for wealthy corporations. It is to this kind of abuse that James turns his attention in chapter 5. Let's look at the first six verses of James chapter 5. It goes like this. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury 
and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Let me start by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about reforming political and economic systems. That's not because there aren't political and economic systems that need reforming, but that isn't what James is talking about. James is talking about people, not just systems. There is a strain of religious thought called liberation theology. Liberation theology had its origins within the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America during the mid-1950s. And it rose to prominence as there were dictators coming to power and pushing peasant workers into lives of grinding poverty. Here's the summary description from the Encyclopedia Britannica as to what liberation theology taught. Liberation theology sought to apply religious faith by aiding the poor and oppressed through involvement in political and civic affairs. It stressed both heightened awareness of the sinful socioeconomic structures that cause social inequities and active participation in changing those structures. In other words, it was the attempt to link the gospel to a political system and seeing that as the goal of the gospel. But that's what became problematic. U.S. Catholic Magazine said this, some strains of liberation theology used Marxist economic theory, applying it to the gospel. Liberation theology often calls for reorganization of social, governmental, and economic structures so that the poor are not merely cared for, but brought into the fullness of human flourishing. But here's the problem. Systems and structures are operated by people. And the gospel reminds us that all of us as people have a deep problem with selfishness. Have you ever noticed that the leaders of systems that espouse social and economic equality for all, those people always seem to live at a different level than those under their rule? George Orwell wrote the famous political satire, Animal Farm. And in it, the animals rebel against their human overlords and set up their own system of government that is to guarantee a farm where all animals can be free, equal, and happy. And the first rule of their new perfect society is all animals are equal. Quite soon, though, the farm descends into a type of fascism under the rule of a pig named Napoleon. And in justifying why the pigs seem to have it better than everyone else, one of the pigs declares, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now, I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't seek righteous or just laws. It's, it's just that you can't, by rule of law, make selfish people just or righteous. James' focus is on the person, not the system. Something else we need to clarify is who James is talking to. Who are these corrupt, rich people that he has such harsh words for? Are, are they members of the churches to whom he is writing? Well, some of them, perhaps, could be. Churches have open doors. Anybody can walk in. But I don't think he's issuing his warning to true followers of Jesus. If you look at his words, there is no hint of redemption. He speaks to these oppressors as people who oppress to the bitter end and face certain judgment. Of course, if he's writing to people like that, it would be fair to guess that those folks aren't going to spend any time reading his letter. So, is this a wasted warning? I think James writes as he does for two reasons. First, he's writing more for the benefit of the oppressed than the oppressor. While there were people of wealth and social status that were part of the early church, the majority of believers came from poorer classes. It's not surprising. 
the majority of the population was poor. These people led hard lives. The money that they earned today was the money they needed to buy dinner tonight. And if they got cheated, they knew that the system was often rigged against them. If they had the audacity to take the cheater to court, they might discover that the cheater and the judge were golfing buddies. And like many societies the world over, corruption was everywhere. When I was in the Ukraine, the people would talk about the corruption that seeped into every pore of their society. If you went to the hospital, you literally had to bribe the doctors and nurses in order to get good treatment. One church that I met the leaders of told me how they had lost their property because the local crime boss decided that he wanted the property. And using a clever bit of legal manipulation, he paid off the right officials and he simply took their property, building and all. To people living in such conditions, there were questions burning in their hearts. Maybe Psalm 10 verse 1 came to mind. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Where is justice? What's the point of doing the right thing? Why practice things like humility, integrity, gentleness, and, and when I live in a world that's dominated by the proud, the dishonest, and the cruel? To these people, James reminds them that there is a day of judgment and justice coming. He reminds them that the symbols of power and success, which were constantly waved in their faces but held out of their reach, were in fact false flags. They shouldn't let envy for what they have or don't have fester and poison their hearts and minds. And that while their plight might be hard, their God has not forgotten them, and He is not on the side of the corrupt. Second, sometimes powerful people do fall under conviction. Is it the norm? No, hardly. In fact, Jesus said that it was actually easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not that riches themselves are wrong, but if you think you can build your own heaven, why would you humble yourself to seek after God's? But sometimes, even powerfully corrupt people ask themselves probing questions in the quiet of the night. And for those who dare, James gives them some sobering news. There is a judge. There is a judgment day. And your phony piece of heaven, if that is all you cling to, will one day be little more than the kindling for God's refining fire. James addresses two issues, two errors of the powerful. First, you have hoarded foolishly. Prior to AD 70 in Palestine, the ownership of land began consolidating into the hands of a small group of ultra-wealthy landowners. Small farmers found themselves being assimilated into these large operations and forced to hire themselves out to these rich landlords. And not all landlords were good people. In their lust for greater wealth, it was often gained at the expense of their laborers. Let me take you back to Psalm 10, picking up at verse 3. The wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. Well, James has news for these smug oligarchs. He says, your ill-gotten gains are not going to last. 
He says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. Your riches. He says, your riches have rotted. You're going to find that that bundle of Franklin's you've been hiding in a can has gotten water damaged, filled with mildew. It's falling apart. And your fine clothing. One day you're going to go to the back of your closet to pull out that beautiful Armani and discovers that some little moths have hosted a dinner party. Oh, and your precious metals. The, the things that are supposed to be rust-proof and a safe hedge for the future, well, those things are going to corrode. Have you been tracking gold prices these past few weeks? Do you know why it's skyrocketing? Well, people are worried. And they're trying to put their money into something that may be recession-proof. But James says that if you're putting all your eggs in that basket, it turns out that on Judgment Day, you're going to be shocked to discover that your pockets are loaded not with gold dust, but gold rust. Interestingly, the word translated here as corrosion can also be used of poison. Someday you will find that not only have your riches lost their value, but they've poisoned you in the process. He says you have laid up riches in the last days. James sees the arc of history moving towards its conclusion, a conclusion that will ultimately be marked by Jesus' return. And he's mindful that Jesus told his, follower, his, told his followers to live expectant lives, lives that were eager to invest their energies and resources in serving God. Lives that moved at every level toward his priorities, priorities of love and compassion, priorities of justice and redemption. But what he sees the powerful doing is trying to build their own kingdoms, amassing when they should be investing, withholding when they should be giving, loving themselves rather than others. And he reminds them that the end is in sight. And it's not the end that they're trying to create for themselves. The problem isn't that they have riches. It is the way they are hoarding those riches. James says, You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. They created lies for themselves that weren't just pleasant. They lived a life devoted to self-gratification, even to the point of destroying others or passively watching them suffer. The New Living Translation says, You have spent your, ear, your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. So first, James condemns them because they have hoarded foolishly. Second, he says they have acted corruptly. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. That's an interesting figure of speech. We find similar language in Genesis, way back in the beginning, Genesis 4.10, where the Lord says to Cain after the death of his brother, What have you done? The, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Or think of Jesus as he was making his final entry into the city of Jerusalem. Exuberant crowds were beginning to cheer and sing a song of praise, and the jealous Pharisees demanded that Jesus make them stop. And Jesus responded this way in Luke 19. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. In each of these situations, the thing occurring is treated as so significant that even inanimate objects are compelled to shout about it. Interestingly, the Greek construction that James uses here could be translated as the wages are crying out from you. In other words, you have those workers' money in your pocket and it is shouting out of your pocket over the injustice of what you've done. But of course, it's not just the cash that is crying out. 
The cries of the harvesters themselves are being heard. And who is hearing them? The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. James could have chosen any number of descriptive names for God, but the one he chooses is Lord of hosts. Another way that could be translated is the God of armies. Whenever that term shows up, it is an indicator that God is prepared to judge and that nothing will stand in his way. So be warned, you oppressors. There is a judge coming with more power than you can stand against, the commander of the armies of heaven. And be encouraged, you oppressed. The judge that is coming is listening to you. He will not be bribed, and he will not look the other way. The closing words of Psalm 10 go like this. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. The final words of this passage accuse these oppressors not simply of depriving, but even condemning and murdering good people who had caused no harm or even offered resistance. James says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. These oppressors had rigged the system in such a way that good people with just claims ended up condemned. And in depriving them of what was their due, they had even contributed to their deaths. So what do we do with this passage? Or maybe better, what should this passage do to us? I'm not aware of any oppressive landowners or merchants in our church family. But then again, there are lots of things I don't know. Within our society, there are multiple ways, though, that we interface with others when it comes to paying for services. Some of us have businesses where we hire employees. But even if you don't have employees formerly hired, anyone who has ever eaten in a restaurant has, at the very least, been waited on by someone who relies on tips for the majority of their income. Here's the question I'm tempted to ask when it comes to deciding what to pay others. What's the least I can pay? How can I keep more money in my pocket? Now, I like a good deal as much as the next guy. But as I think about this passage, it seems to me the question I should be asking is, what is fair to this person? They have all the same expenses I do. They have the same desires that I do. They have the same number of hours in their day to meet their needs. We looked at the definition of godly wisdom a few weeks ago. One characteristic was that it was impartial. In other words, not self-seeking, but seeking to do what is fair to all. So what if I tipped the wait staff using Jesus' golden rule? You remember that, right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Or we could paraphrase it, whatever you wish that others would tip you, do also to them. I'd even take this thinking a step further. Not just what should you tip that waiter or waitress, but how should you treat them while they wait on you? My wife had a conversation with a friend recently who has waitressed for years. And somehow, Sundays, going to church, and eating out came up. Our friend related that it's common knowledge among wait staff that the after-church lunch crowd is one of the most difficult. Lousy attitudes, lousy tippers. If that's you, let me make a suggestion. Either take Jesus with you to lunch in such a way that your waiter will know Jesus is seated at the table, or make yourself a sandwich at home. How about those contractors you hire? They set their own pay scale, they're not relying on your tips, but you are the one that writes the check. Do you pay them promptly? 
or do you pick and poke at the work they've done trying to get them to reduce the bill? Not because there's really anything wrong, but you're hoping you can get a deal by being that annoying squeaky wheel. Do you honor the terms of your deal with them? I'm not saying that honest people will never have a misunderstanding. What I'm talking about is looking for loopholes or ways to exploit or simply cheat on what you've agreed to. I remember working for a doctor. We were clearing out his clinic and he had scripture verses hanging everywhere in his office. And he made a big deal about being a Christian, a person of faith. Now, the way the deal worked, we were going to clean out his office and uh, we were going to do all that in exchange for having exclusive rights to sell his unneeded equipment. He had signed the contract and we had talked it through. As part of trying to help him get his stuff moved out quickly because his uh, lease was up on his office, I sent a manager from another clinic uh, to look at some items that were still on site. I told the doctor that my client was coming and that though I couldn't be there, I would follow up with them to handle any purchases they wanted to make. Now what the doctor didn't know was that the person I sent was also a longtime client of mine and actually a good friend. My friend called me later to let me know that the doctor had suggested that they do a deal on the side without me. You see, that doctor was happy to use our services, but as soon as he had a chance to put a little more in his pocket at my expense, he had no problem trying to sneak out of the agreement. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't believe a contractor should ever have to call you back asking for their money. Maybe you're the person who's been cheated. Maybe it's festering in your soul and poisoning your attitude. Or maybe you're thinking, okay, if that's how the game is played, I'll play it too. Cheat and be cheated. I've heard people justify bad business behavior on the business of, that's just how this business is done. I think James would encourage us to rein in those emotions and mindsets. Don't buy into a false narrative that winning means getting the most toys. Toys will rust. Don't get caught up in vengeful thinking. The Lord of hosts knows what has happened. You forgive and let him be the judge. And finally, give thought to where you're investing your time, your energy, your treasure. If you knew Jesus was coming back next Saturday, would you handle your time, money, possessions any differently this week? If so, what's the difference between that and how you're handling those things now? I'm not suggesting that you run out, sell everything, and start throwing money out of your car window. I'm just asking if the way you've organized the expenditure of your time and treasure gives greater evidence of God's values or your pleasure. Would you be comfortable if he stopped by to chat about it? There are uns these are uncertain times, I know. And when I get fearful, I want to pull in. I'm inclined to hoard, to stop living generously. Here's the advice Jesus once gave to people who were financially fearful of the future. It comes from Luke chapter 12. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't know exactly what that means for you, but I do know that if we treat our treasure and others the way Jesus wants us to, people will see the opportunity of doing business with us as a great blessing. And people who are hurting 
will find themselves helped. Amen. Please join us in singing a closing song. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Hello, church, and welcome to the discussion and reflection portion of today's service. I'm Sean Stanton, the adult ministries pastor here at DCC. First, I want to repeat something that I concluded with last week. You know, even though I may give you three or four discussion or reflection questions, just remember you don't have to answer them all. Maybe only one of the questions will be enough to get your discussion started. 
And then here's the other thing. There are always many good points in these sermons and Bible passages. So if the Holy Spirit alerts you to a specific point in the passage, then spend your time there. And remember, this is an opportunity to get closer and deeper with each other and with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in today's sermon, we covered the first six verses of, cha of James chapter 5. In those six verses, Pastor Tim keyed on three main points. They were the warning for those who willingly oppress and hurt others to become rich, the hope for those who are or have been hurt by the oppressor, and then the third one focused on how living in the last days should always be our Christian perspective. So oppression comes primarily in two forms. Systems, like governments, can be oppressive, but individuals can also be oppressive. Today, James is addressing the individual oppressor. So here's our first discussion and reflection question for today. So although it doesn't appear that James is directly referring to Christians as the oppressors, how might we, even as Christians, in some way be oppressive or unfair in our dealings with others? Second question, what encouragement did James give to the oppressed? How does this encourage you? Also, maybe give an example of how you may have at one time been treated unfairly. Third question is, how does the way we live our lives today reflect where our treasure is stored? Okay, so this last point of discussion or reflection is one I'm thinking of including every week. It's a question we should ask ourselves every time we open the Bible. Here it is. What did today's passage tell you about our God? And how does this reality increase your desire for a more intimate understanding and relationship with Him? So those are our questions for this week. I hope they lead you into a time of spirit-led prayer, fellowship, and meditation. Have a great day. I'll see you next week.